Hello and welcome. Hope you guys enjoyed the combine. Sims and Lefko is back in the flesh. We're back. I know that Sims is just face deep in football. He didn't even mention Wilder Ortiz when he walked in. Mr. Boxing. Did you watch it? No. You didn't watch Wilder win? I totally forgot about it. Holy shit. I you know what? I heard somebody talking about boxing today, too. And you didn't even realize. And I was like, what are they talking about? That's how into football you are right I now. I Yes. You are in GM <laughs> Scout Holy run. crap. I didn't even think about that Saturday night. That's amazing. So it was, it was a great fun fight. to watch? Yeah. Well, it's just, it was a classic heavyweight fight. Right. It was great. Right. Uh, coming up at the end of the episode, it's going to be an interview Damn. with Peter Berg, who is also involved with boxing with Mark Wahlberg, the director, producer, actor. He was great. He was awesome. He busted my balls while yeah, being Eagles fans for like 15 minutes. It was awesome. So that's at the end. <laughs> I want to give a quick shout out to uh, Jim Kelly. Our thoughts are with you, my man. They are. Uh, he's battling oral cancer again. Yes. He came on our pod and talked about, you know, supporting it and donating. And to be honest, I have so much faith in Jim Kelly at this point. You he know is, what I mean? Like uh, he's just a soldier, man. He is. He's your typical Western Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh tough guy. What? You're going to break my jaw and reconstruct it? Fine. Let's do, do it. it. I know. He, uh, Love that guy. Man. I had, I had a inkling you know we're represented by the same people as you know my agent Steve yeah. Rosner and all them and and I knew this you was knew. coming yeah, yeah I knew there were some concerns again well I'll tell you what we hung out with him and I, he he's just tough man he is and thoughts are with him man. no doubt about uh, it we are going to get to Sims's quarterback evaluations of what he saw at the combine I have a few good left coat takes here I want to just recap what we've seen for you guys uh, also make sure to check out stick to football because they're going to really dive deep on all of the position groups and all of that cool and we're going to cover a lot of the big stories uh also look franchise tag deadline is tuesday yeah. march 6th yeah and we, we got, we're gonna start off with nfl before we get to the combine right there was a trade this weekend yes robert quid going to the dolphins right. robert quinn from the rams for it's either gonna be a third or a fourth round pick what do you think about that before we get into the combine? Yeah, I thought it was – what did I see? I thought it was a fourth maybe. I think it's a fourth. Is it a fourth? A third yeah. and a fourth maybe? But um, either way, I think it was a uh, – it, listen, it's a good trade for the Miami Dolphins. It gets them a, another pass rusher. Uh, again, their defensive line was one of their strengths of their team last year. So uh, from that standpoint, I look at Ram, it and go, Second Ram and back-to-back -back off seasons that they've gone and gotten. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, who'd they get last year? The dude that didn't believe in dinosaurs. Oh, William Hayes. You're right. Yes. My old buddy, William. Yeah. Well, he's um, stupid for that one. I'll tell you that much. You hear me, William Hayes? <laughs> they did not plant dinosaur bones around. Uh, but uh, again, it adds a guy off the uh, off the edge. He's certainly still, I'm not going to say top tier pass he's rusher. He's not where he was three years no. ago. No. And, and I think the big thing is when you look at him in general, and I understand the Rams wanting to get rid of him, is from two things. He's been hurt a lot recently, right? 2016, I know he missed a bunch of games. 2015, I believe he missed a bunch of games. Sure. And the Rams, again, let's not, we have to stress this point. Aaron Donald has to be paid. That is number one priority. Plus LaMarcus Joyner. Plus LaMarcus Joyner, who I would expect gets franchise tag right, here, right? Right. Right. And then you also got to think Todd Gurley's coming up soon. What I like and is, you're go off is that, that. No, no, right. there's, there's a lot of teams right. that have a few stars and then they try and pay them all and it ruins the long term future. Robert Quinn's a guy that it's time to move on from. Get a draft pick and then build somewhere else. They need big guys on the D line to go along with Aaron Donald. They do. They don't have Aaron a, Donald will make it easier lack, for everybody else. They lack that. You're right. So franchise Rockers tag deadline is Tuesday. Yeah. And right now it looks like there are three guys that are going to get the tag. And we're doing this on a Monday, so we'll see what happens. We're going to do more tags on Wednesday. Three guys right now. We Jarvis got Landry. Yep. Le'Veon Bell, right. Demarcus Lawrence. Right. Looks like he's going to get the tag from the they Cowboys. They better. I mean, they better. Uh, franchise tag Demarcus uh, Lawrence. They have nothing else. They have nothing else. I mean, he's he's arguably their best player on the defensive side of the football. Uh, Le'Veon Bell likely to get it. it. would be the second year in a row, which moves him up to the $14, 15000000 million. It's funny. You could either end up being a Tremaine Johnson where you get two years of a lot of money and then you're a free agent. Or you end up being a Kirk Cousins where you get two years of a lot of money and then the team still wants you right. and then they're in a situation. And I think Le'Veon Bell is a guy that you're going to keep wanting. Um I realized something. Yes. I was watching a short documentary about Jarvis Landry, and I realized that the 2014 draft class, in addition to being one of the most talented we've ever seen, yeah. has a player in it that I think will lead to more holdouts. This is a draft class that has Odell, Aaron Donald, yeah. and I think a lot of them look at Ryan Shazier 
And I think he is the wake-up player of this generation. Mm, In the documentary of Jarvis Landry, he said, I want to get paid a long-term security and look at what happened to Ryan Shazier. Ryan Shazier might not play football again. Ryan Shazier was the 15th pick in the first round. Shit, look at the guy Landry hurt last year, Aaron Williams. He's never going to play again. So what I'm saying is I think all of these young stars, now Le'Veon Bell was the draft before, I think they're all looking at Ryan Shazier, and I think that's why they're not going to be afraid to hold out. Because the thing is, they go, oh, what if you miss this? And they can now say, well, what if what happened to Ryan happens to me? Yeah, sure. And I'm a firm believer that that draft class, not only because they're so talented, but because they've, they're they going through this as a friend, I think it's going to change contract negotiations from here on out. I, I hope so. I mean, I think guys are too quick to buckle with the franchise tag too many times. Like, sit out the whole year. Come back week 10. Make it a vest a year that counts. You come back week ten, you get the last six weeks of the game check. Screw them. Then become a free agent after. To me, in a lot of ways, it's not that dumb of a play because yeah, okay, you're gonna leave money on the field that year for your franchise right. tag, but you're saving your body for one, and then two, you're gonna make up a lot of that money with guarantees when you become a free agent after that. So yeah. it's not a crazy thought. That was just my thing when I heard him talking about Shazier. It was that aha moment where I went. Look, I, I don't want to say that you sacrifice for anything, Ryan, but I think it's going to change the mindset of a I, lot of players. I, I hope. Because it's not just an Aaron Williams. This was a future star, like, star in the NFL already, Ryan Shazier. Mm-hmm. And sometimes a big tree needs to fall to feel an impact. Yeah. And I think it, it, I just think it was an awakening moment for a lot of NFL players. I, I, I really hope so. Le'Veon Bell, I'm going to be interested to see where this whole thing goes. I mean, it's of course, he's going to get, what, like 14-something million, 14, right? 14, 15, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he's going to get that. Uh And, you know, again, I don't think he can think that he's going to get that on the market on a year-to-year basis average. I I don't think that's going to happen. So he's going to have to realistically, I think, bring his number down a little. The good thing about signing the tag is when you negotiate with the team, you go, I'm not going to let up that $15 million you're supposed to pay me this year. Sure. So it kind of locks that in for like a first-year salary, which is pretty nice. Well, that's what we saw with Blake Bortles. Exactly. exactly right. Yes, you're going to see that. So then it's just about what's the guarantees after that that make you feel comfortable for you to go okay that's enough for me not to do this whole franchise tag thing again next year Landry let me just say this is really interesting too because I think at the end of the day there's a big part of me that thinks he's gonna get stuck with the Dolphins even though I don't think the Dolphins really want him I don't think so either that's why he signed that tag so quick exactly right when he signed that I went he just realized that that Josh Norman they rescinded that crip and they might not be able to find a trade to actually pay him anything near he wants so he was like where did I sign that let me get over there yes yeah right away no doubt about it I, I, I have a hard time thinking it i mean hey it's I like hear- a sign and trade even if he gets traded he's still going to get 16 mil right Yes, he is. Right. I mean, but nobody's going to trade for him unless they feel like there's a preliminary contract in in terms already there in place. So yeah, I thought you know, the same thing when I you saw hear that. the Bears. Hey, the Bears certainly Bears would Ravens. fit good, right? The Ravens, he fits that as well. I would I would like to see the Ravens go for something else other than a Jarvis Landry. I mean, the Ravens just, are the king of getting receivers who can't really get open. I, the, mm. That's what's funny to me. I mean, they got Mike Wallace. I know he was a speed guy. It didn't quite work out the way it should have. Landry and that Nagy offense in Chicago. Chicago would be pretty cool it, it, with no, Trabisky and exactly Tariq right. and Jordan Howard. Exactly right. He yeah. could be that Tyree Kill, Travis Kelsey, work the middle of the field. He could kind of do what both of them do to agree in the past He's more game. like an elite Albert Wilson. It, that's really what he is. He's yeah. a really good slot receiver. Jarvis yeah. Landry's not going to beat Julian Edelman in a 40-yard race, like straight ahead. And But to be honest, owning the middle of the field is, is, a, a, is a very important thing, a right thing. Now. The other team I would say that I would think could be interesting just to look at, and I, I, I'm I, – the, the Titans with Jarvis Landry. Okay. Because at some point they need to get Marcus Mariota. Yeah, they felt like they got Eric Decker and it was like that's not the guy. No, and I, and I believe he's Corey done this Davis. year. Right. So you got a Corey Davis, right? He could be the kind of vertical down the field one-on-one matchup guy. And then a Landry. But then you get a Landry that could be again, it's Matt LaFleur who's from Kyle Shanahan. He could be Landry could be that better version of a Sanu in Atlanta. Mm. That guy that's awesome run blocking. He's awesome at working in the middle of the field and then you can trust him to run all the those option routes and do the dirty stuff, plus the speed sweeps and things off of a Mariota bootleg and all that, I would say watch out for them too. Other thing that happens during Combine Weekend is, man, the rumors start coming out. Oh, baby. I wrote down like 30 rumors, and I'm only going to talk about three because – where these guys end up in free agency, I'd rather just wait. Yeah, okay. But Kirk Cousins, rumored to be looking for a three-year, $90 million guaranteed deal. Mm. So three years, $30 million each, which 
Kirk is trying to milk some people, baby. Uh, Matt Miller, right here at Bleacher Report and Sick to Football, saying it is down to the Jets and the Vikings. No and, doubt. And there was a story that came out a few days ago that said that the Jets fear that Cousins would take less to go to Minnesota for a better chance to win. We said this last week. We expect Kirk to go to Minnesota. Do you think it's going to be for three for 90, though? No, I, I don't. don't think so either. I think that's the reality that's going to set it. In fact, the only team I think is going to pay him three for 90 is the, is the Jets. Right, exactly right. Let me ask right. you. Right. If you were Kirk Cousins, right. and you know what the Minnesota Vikings have, and you know what the Jets have, right. and let's say the Minnesota Vikings are offering you three for 70, and the Jets are offering you three for 90, and all of it's guaranteed, right. where are you going? You, like Chris Sims, if you yeah. were Kirk Cousins. Yeah, so three for 70, so you're going like $23 million a year, right? Or 30 yeah, or thirty and million. And it's all year. guaranteed, and you know what the Vikings are, and you know what the Jets are, and you know what you have in the bank. You know, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. If you put me in that same situation yeah. where I've been franchised, tag, uh, your Chris Sims would take three or seventy million. You would take less money. I would. I don't really give a damn. That extra twenty is not going to make or break his life at this point. It's just I don't really think so not. Either. And and really, if you get on a successful team and then win the Super Bowl, or you're consistently deep in the NFC playoffs, you're going to get plenty of money on the back end through commercial deals and everything like 100%. that to make up some of that difference. Now, listen, I know you're never going to make it, but again, hey, listen, you to me. I mean, what would you do? Is there a difference I between if at, you have 150 in the bank and 130? Are I you look, really? I like, like to break everything down to a year to year. Right. Right. So I would focus on that 20 and 20 over three years is less than seven million dollars different a year. And I would go, you know what, if I win, the rest of my life will be happy right. because no one's going to say I'm just a guy that went to the playoffs. Plus, like Jets have at, questions. He's a so. Minnesota guy. He's not a New York guy, just like as a person. I know. But what I think is interesting is one guy who's very attentive. Another rumor Aaron Rodgers. Right. Apparently, they're very close to a deal, but Aaron says that he wants to wait before Cousins signs his contract to sign his new contract. He fucking better, right? Exactly. Right. Aaron Rodgers. I mean, do they really think Aaron Rodgers is going to be dumb enough to go? You know what? I'll sign my contract before Drew Brees and Kirk Cousins. I'm only the greatest quarterback uh, on the planet right now. He's the sixth highest paid quarterback in the NFL right now, and I think. There's got to be a party that's like, we're making you the highest paid quarterback in the NFL. And then one day later, someone signs for more. Because, you know, that's the whole thing. You want you want that title for a list a little well, bit. Well, yeah, you want the title. You really just want the respect. It's not even about the title necessarily, I don't think, for an Aaron Rodgers. He's just going to go. If he decided to go one day and sign for $28 million a year, and then the next day Kirk Cousins signs for $29 million a year or $30 million a year, it's going to just piss him off from the simple fact that he's going to go, this guy's not even in my class. Like, listen, yeah. Kirk Cousins is a good NFL starter, but he's not in my class, and he's going to get paid more money right. and hasn't won a Super Bowl and hasn't carried the franchise. So that's what, it's just going to piss you off from a personal standpoint. You know, again, Rodgers is another guy that I would expect, like, let, listen, I, he deserves to be paid, like, the highest, but I, I would think he's going to be smart enough to not hold their feet over the fire completely. Like, he's going to realize, okay, I'd like to be paid the highest, but I'm not going to, like, ask for something to really put the stamp on it. Do you think Aaron's signing, like, a five-year deal, or do you think it's more of a three-year? Do you think he's going long-term, huge number, or short-term, more guaranteed? What do you think Aaron's doing? I think he would probably go a little longer for the benefit of the team. Yeah. I do, just to take away a little bit. Yeah, take away a little of the year-to-year hurt. I yeah. would hope so. I mean, if he wants to win a Super Bowl, more Super Bowls. and I just fucking hate that. I hate the fact that we have to go, oh, no, the best player on the team should take a little bit less money to help out the rest of the team. I know. Well, what about all the other guys you overpaid? Yeah, I, I get that. It's it's messed up. It really is. Hey, we can't pay you too much, really, because according to what I saw at the second half of the season, you can't pay me enough yeah, I for know. what the fuck I bring your team. I know. One guy that I, I think Aaron Rodgers is the quarterback of the podcast, right. and I feel like defensive line – for before this year, for like three years, it was Michael Bennett. Yeah, I feel like Michael Bennett was the podcast guy. We love dudes that could shift to the middle. Who took his spot? Who took his spot? Clowney took his spot for us. I think Clowney kind of overwrote. No, I think Fletcher Cox took his spot. Or him too. Yeah, I think Fle- we were very high on Fletcher this yes. year. Yes, but Michael Bennett for years. Yes, and apparently he's on the trade block, and the Falcons are interested. Mm. Um, where is Michael Bennett still where he was? Michael Bennett is not where he was. He's still really good. I think you'll remember. Remember there was a game this year where I wrote notes and I wrote like Michael Bennett's not the same. And I wrote like a, a frown face emoji on yeah. it because I love watching Michael Bennett. He was again, he would be one of the kings of he fucked a play up 
and there's no stat for it, mm. but somebody else, Bobby Wagner, got the tackle, even though Michael Bennett was the one who ruined the play. Wearing kicker shoulder pads. Right, exactly right. Uh, so he was always the, gr- I mean, great to watch. But no, he's not as dominant. He's yeah. not as disruptive as like a Jadeveon Clowney or an Aaron Donald or a Fletcher Cox, but still awesome. Would still love him on the Falcons. Caliber, yes. No way the Seahawks trade him to the Falcons, though. I wouldn't think so. Do, are the Seahawks about to start breaking all this down? I think so. I think that's what they're doing. I think surely, but surely. I mean, I'm, I'm very proud of them. The fact that they didn't panic with this franchise tag on Sheldon Richardson. He does not deserve that. Jimmy Graham's going to be leaving, too, it right, looks like. Right, Which, man, the market for him is going to be huge. I mean, there, he's got some teams. I, I, I have some social videos coming out about these kind do of you? teams. Yeah, I do. And I would go like, man, there's some teams. He He's in the right year of free agency, right? Because let me just throw these four teams at you that could sure. possibly New England, of course. Of course. And that's an outside chance. Especially with Gronk and Gronk the issue, right. But we know how important the position is. Um, Matt Nagy, Chicago Bears. He needs a Travis Kelsey. Mr. Versatile. Right. Wow. Now, Houston Texans. Uh, Fedorowicz looks like he might retire because Steven of the concussion. Anderson. Steven Anderson's there, yes. The kid from Cal, yeah. right? They have uh, the other kid from UConn, Griffin, Ryan, right, Griffin, Ryan Griffin, right? But nobody's special on that roster. And that's the Patriots offense. Exactly that they need right. A tight end. And then the team I think he's going Saints. back to is the New Orleans Saints. Yeah, that's he's where the rumors coming. right now. Oh, he's going back. So they're going to have Unger and Jimmy Graham. Yeah, they're going to get Unger and Jimmy Graham. Colby Fleener experiment has not quite worked. Nope. And uh, Jimmy Graham, I think, is also going to realize, Damn. like, man, I'll take two million lefts because – Fucking Sean Payton seems to get me the ball a lot and always creates a great mismatch for me. I would love to be there at his press conference and be like, <laughs> so what were the differences between Bevel and Payton? Huh? Uh, let's go to the combine. Uh, again, Sims's quarterback evaluation will be coming up at the end of this. Uh, and you came in here talking about Rashad Penny. I want to talk about him later, but how much film have you been watching since I, we spoke last I'm, Wednesday? I'm just trying to slowly crack through it. I haven't how many gone players through a would ton. you say you've gone through? I'm going, I guess I'm only about like 15. I've I've seen bits and pieces of a lot of guys, like guys where I was watching. And I was like, man, I've seen him. Yeah. Let me just look at him just a, like a POA tape, like I've told you about, point, yes. where it's like basically point a highlight attack. type, highlight tape that I just go through re- what I call newsreel it and like just go, okay, let me just get a feel for him before I really study for him in case I have to talk about him. I definitely watched not as much combine as I usually do because I'm usually here, but I did have some overall takeaways. Um, I hate the immediate 40 clock. There is no longer a delay between when they finish oh, and the I time. Know, it's right on. You're right. Because it used to be they'd finish and then it would be like two You'd seconds. Guess, and, and, there like, was, and there was four, four, five. There was a reveal. Right. And now it's like immediate. And I like that pause. Yes. I also think it's hilarious when they show the comps of like a, a, a player to another player that measures. Yeah. And I'll just never forget when Marcus Mariota, the exact height, weight, 40, like hand size was Chris Sims yes. for Marcus well, Mariota. His 40 was faster, yeah, 40 but was his hand faster. size was smaller but yes the other thing is i noticed a lot of athletes this weekend that were like versatile tweeners that were being completely celebrated yeah. that had no legs and ass right like all the linebackers and all these tight ends and i was like none of them have a lower body no, and they're agree. being celebrated for being versatile i was like i'm seeing a lot of barkevious mingos out there this year <laughs> there was yeah i i do think it's a year where just like top end elite specimens i don't see a lot no there's like 10 to 12 maybe yeah. 15 somewhere in that range but it's not like some years past where we've been like damn what d tackle and dn do you even choose here or, right like two years ago there was like 20 defensive linemen a, right i mean we i had a bunch of them go in the first round they ended up all going in the second it round it was the it was the Deron Robin, Sean Robinson, Robinson yeah. all them, right? Exactly right. Yeah, but this year I'm like, I don't see a lot of size. Like even, even like Chubb, like the defensive end from NC State that we'll talk about later. Yeah. Like even I was like, I would like a little more legs and ass. Yeah, it's there. Yeah, believe me, I saw it in person. It's it's He's there. It's, but it pops right in your face. The <laughs> star of Combine Weekend though was Shaquem Griffin, who I believe is going to be this year's James Conner. He's going to be the guy that like leads NFL jersey sales, and he's yeah. like the incredible story. Yep. He is the kid from UCF. His brother Shaquille Griffin went last year. The kid with one hand. Um, I got to watch him. I haven't watched him. He ran a four three eight. Yep. He put up twenty reps on the bench press. Uh, people are now saying he's expected to be drafted in the fourth round heading into the weekend. He wasn't even going to be invited to the combine right. before the Senior Bowl. And I was just curious as you were watching him. I have a little 
rant to go on, but yeah. I'm curious, what are your thoughts in general about what you saw and what he looks like? Yeah, I mean, super impressive. I don't know what I'm more impressed with, with the bench or the 40. But the 40 was, I guess, the most surprising. Was, I mean, he shot. I mean, he shot out of a cannon. It's when, the as soon fastest as he took time off, recorded since 03. I was just amazed by it. I really was. Uh, and listen, this is the modern-day NFL linebacker, these type of guys. Ryan Chazier, who we talked about to start the podcast. Telvin Smith, those kind of players. Deion Jones, who I yes. think is a little more bi- big and muscle dense. I, I, I kept hearing them say that comparison, and no, they were no, they were comparing Roquan Smith oh, to Deion Jones. Or was and I, agree, Ro- I agree. Oh, with you're that. right. You're right. You're Just right. Just like like a bowling ball. That's what it was. You're right. It was him. I got I got him confused. But um, I I am interested to see how the hand affects him or lack of a hand. I'm not trying to be when funny. When you watch the tape. Yeah. Like, does he miss tackles? Is there balls that go down the middle of the field where you go, again, I'm not trying to be funny here, everybody. No, you're not. If there's a no, ball that goes over evaluation. his head. Right. And can he, you know, to have the extra six inches of what you have your hand there. Yes. Just little things like that. Being able to wrap and tackle. whatever. We saw pre- issues with JPP two years ago when he only had three fingers. Right. So I can't imagine. I'm excited to watch it, and I'm going sure. to watch it this week. I think what's so interesting is when I hear people talking about it. They keep going, he's really good, but, you know, he doesn't have 10 fingers. Yeah, he's, he's really good, but he doesn't have a hand. And I'm not, they're not evaluating him like we evaluate everyone else. So mm-hmm. I'm going to evaluate him, yeah. and I just want to ask you some questions. Cool. I don't have takes. I only have questions. This is a kid that last year had 20 tackles for loss and 11 and a half sacks. Mm-hmm. I always look at that ratio with defensive linemen. That's like some Aaron Donald stuff when right. you have double digit that high. He was second team all Florida in high school, and I know that means a lot to you. It definitely I does. bet you he would have been first team if he had a hand. Yeah. And I bet you they're like, let's just put him second team because he doesn't have a hand. Yeah, you're right. I'll say this. We have a Dak Prescott theory which is we would have known Dak Prescott was good if we realized the rest of that Mississippi State offense had no one going to the NFL. Right. Who were the big prospects on UCF? I don't see anybody, no. but they were an undefeated team that beat Auburn. Yes. So he's probably the guy. One of the best, at least. Right. right? That right. makes that system go. Yes. Okay, so when you don't have a hand – what does that prevent you from doing? First thing that comes to mind is exactly what you said, pass defense, yeah. interceptions. Well, guess what? Roquan Smith, the number one inside linebacker in this draft, do you know how many career interceptions he had at Georgia? Two. Zero. Whoa, okay. You know how many passes defended? Three. How about hmm. this? Brian Erlacher right. just got inducted to the Hall of Fame. How many interceptions did he have in his career at UNLV? Oof. Zero? He had four. Okay. Okay? Well, guess what? Shaquem had three, so he had three more than the best linebacker in this draft, yeah. one less than Brian Urlacher. Right. Roquan Smith defended three passes. Shaquem defended 16 in three years. So I don't really think the hand is that much of an issue. Plus, how many fucking times do I have to watch a football game where a linebacker drops the pick and they go, that's why he plays defense? Right. So it's not that it's important. It's not big on an issue, right? Like, let's get over that, right. and he can clearly catch. I have also... Uh, when it comes to tackling, I went on the NFL website and I said, let me, let me look at how they teach kids. What are the steps in tackling? Drive through with the legs, square up. The first mention of hands is the last thing. After you've completely wrapped up, grab cloth. Right. If you're going to tell me, Mr. Football Guy, that you should never arm tackle, well, then you're definitely never going to fucking hand tackle. That sounds worse than arm tackle. No, no. My only thing in that but that part of your theory, like everything else, you're spot on. Don't get me wrong. But yeah. it's the NFL, and you're going to have to arm tackle at of some course. point. Like the first time he sees Leonard Fournette run through the hole, and he goes, holy shit, I'm not going to be able to get there and form tackle in the right, right way like I could all the other running backs. Right. So those are the things I am interested to see when he does have to just stick out the one arm and he has nothing there to grab with. You mentioned JPP. Right. JPP, very effective this year without yep. the fingers on his hands. Mm-hmm. I have seen defensive players go out there with clubs on their arm right and they have been fine in that those are guys that have to adjust in a week yeah. or a year this is a guy who's been evolving with this for years when you lose your sense of smell your hearing gets better right when you lose vision your taste improves his entire body has evolved to make up for that yeah. he didn't suddenly lose his hand in a tragic car accident no he's been living his entire life with that i bet you his forearms are a lot sm- stronger than other people's and his shoulders and his ability to tackle i bet you it's adjusted to that But here's the thing. I know it sounds like I'm saying draft this guy in the first pick in the draft. If we were evaluating him, we would know that a pass rusher at 227 pounds is not going to cut it. Mm -mm. 
That's the thing is we're not we're not they're saying, oh, he can get around to the quarterback. There is not a pass rusher in the NFL that is 227 pounds that's surviving. He is a linebacker. Right. He is, to me, a Hassan Reddick type of guy sure. where you put him in space because at 438. He can track down Christian McCaffrey. No he doubt. can run side to side with Tariq Cohen. So my thing is, is I'm not saying he's a first round pick. Mm-hmm. I don't think a hand is that important to a linebacker, especially if they let him play with with a, a prosthetic. Right. But I would also say, would they let him play? Have you heard any rules on that or anything? Throw, I don't throw a fucking club on him. I don't care. Yeah. Let, yeah, let him play with it. He played with it his whole career. I know. I, know. I just was wondering. Uh, my thing is, is he's not a first round pick. He's definitely not undrafted. I don't think hands are that important. I just think that at 227, I'm more concerned about his weight than the fact that he doesn't have a hand. Yes. That's my rant. Uh, I mean, it's a good rant. I'm... I, I guess I need to watch him. Do you want me to watch him for Wednesday? Of so course. We can talk? Yeah, okay. that's for a good Wednesday. idea. That's okay. a good idea. Since you're talking about it, I'll, I'll try to answer those was, questions. He was clearly the story of the combine. Right. And and for me, I just think that all, all I ever hear is, I don't know, can he can he play without a hand? I don't know. He might not be able to catch a pass without right. a hand. And right. I'm like, you stop evaluating no, him No, like he that. looks – I think you're exactly right with like your Hassan Reddick, whatever it may be. You, you put him in the middle put of the defense space. and you just let him go get the ball. That's the kind of player he looked like just when I saw on TV in versus Auburn in the bowl game. There was yes. another game during the year I caught, too. Um, hey, I did not expect him. I knew he was fast. I did not expect 4-3-8. And I'm not even sure if he's a legit 4-3-8. I don't know. Because the second the run was 4-5 yeah. flat, right? 4-5-8. 4-5-8. So that's a really weird thing he to happen. He also said but... when he put up 20 on the bench press that the crowd like really got him into it. Right. We'll watch the pro day. It's not going to be the first time. But yep. I just, you know, I want right. to have an interesting discussion. Yeah, not yeah. a how about that guy with no hands? Right. Uh, so the guy that really kicked ass, Saquon Barkley. This was the story of the combine to me. That I'm was gonna, the feel-good story. This is the story to me. Joe Thomas, when he was in the combine, put up 28 bench. Saquon did 29. In a 10-yard split, Deshaun Jackson was 155. Saquon, 154. In a 40-yard dash, Devin Hester was a 443. Saquon was a 44 flat. Vertical jump. Julio Jones was 38 and a half. Saquon Barkley, 41 inches. I wrote this down in my notebook as I was watching. Did Saquon have a perfect combine? Was he perfect? All the drills, he looked fluid catching the ball. He had good hips. Of all the running backs doing the stop short, he looked the quickest at change of direction. Did he have a perfect combine? Yes. And let me just say, I think he's perfect in general. I mean, not only and, – and he fits the alpha male fucking handsome as hell theory as well. <laughs> yes, he does. He, I mean, uh, Lefko blown away by not only the combine, but watching him on film – as another level. He's one of the best running backs I've ever seen in my life on film. I was blown away. I just watched this morning. I turned it on. I was like, all right, let me watch this I guy. I got to see it. Yeah. Just so I can just talk about him a little bit and what it looks like in film. And, of course, I saw him during the year. I, I mean, I, 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 it's one where you really should re- read my notes. He's better than Fournette or Ezekiel Elliott coming out the last two years. He's better than those two. And I, I can't even believe I'm saying that either. He is a freak show. He's... He is in the discussion for one of the best running backs I've ever seen coming out of college. He is. In the open field, he does things that I've never seen anybody do. He makes more happen with less. Now, listen, are there times where he has a hole and all he has to do is run straight? Sure. But I would just tell you that 99% of college football gets tackled on a lot of those runs, and he just runs by people or turns the corner, and people think they got the angle on him. Unbelievable pass catching. Is he as powerful as Fournette or Ezekiel Elliott? No. But he's got like LaShawn McCoy type quicks, except he's faster and more explosive and more powerful. Mm. He is definitely a top five pick. But yeah, he had a perfect combine. I mean, he's got a perfect body. He's he is the he is what he is, in my opinion, the true like epitome of what you want from an NFL modern day running back. Like Fournette and Ezekiel Elliott are still a little old school between the tackles. Right. I know they can catch the ball out of the backfield. I'm not like disrespecting him like that. But this guy is like like a 
like a he's like Ezekiel Elliott with like a Le'Veon Bell mixed in and a LaShawn McCoy all together. It's really interesting skill set, and I was way more blown away by the film than I thought I was going to be. So it's as almost as if we actually talked, but we didn't. But I charted his height, weight, 40, bench, and vertical against Alvin Kamara, Leonard Fournette, Ezekiel Elliott, Todd Gurley, David Johnson, and Le'Veon Bell, and I printed you a copy. And here's what's incredible when you really look at it. Saquon at six foot two thirty three is heavier than every running back there except yep. for Leonard Fournette. He ran a faster forty than everybody. Right. He benched more than everybody, and he had a higher vertical than everybody but David Johnson. Mm. What's incredible is he's eight pounds heavier than Ezekiel Elliott. And he beat him by seven hundredths of a second. Yeah. Ezekiel Elliott, who compared to Fournette, Kamara, Gurley, Ezekiel has speed. Yeah. Well, guess what? Saquon's faster than the fastest guy that we've seen the last few years. Right. I realize, though, by charting all this, he really is David Johnson with the hype. Like when David Johnson came out, when you read the, the re reports then, it's like, oh, he's a receiving guy. He's a third down. David Johnson was 6'1", 224, around a 4'5", with 25 bench, 41 and a half. And when I think about David Johnson and that hop jump and keep running, he's like a he's like a David Johnson with the with the film to back it up. Yes. He's, he's, quick, he's quicker and faster than David Johnson. I mean, yeah, but yes, you're very right. That's what I was trying to paint that picture of. It's like this is the new modern day perfection at running back his route running is extraordinary extraordinary he it's, looks so fluid at the combine it's not on just the wheel routes. it's not just you're saying on the film too. It, the film is he gets to run every route under the sun he's every bit as good as an alvin kamara running routes last year he's special in fact i'm glad you brought this is a great little sheet that you brought out he is um i wrote at the end of my notes that he's basically Todd Gurley, except he's bigger and faster and quicker. I mean, that's, <laughs> so, that's what so I So that wrote. he's not Todd Gurley. I mean, he's, but, yeah. but like he He's has, like Zeke, but he's bigger and has a better jump. He's like Fournette, but he's faster and can catch the ball better out of the backfield. He's like Kamara if Kamara had like 30 pounds more on him. The quickness is off the charts. I love Connor. I right. love him. Right. But the whole Geis is at his, he, he's not on the same planet. No. He's on the same planet. Not on the same Saquon planet. Saquon is and, – and there are a lot of people out there that – like, the big thing was, is he as good as Adrian Peterson? And there was a whole movement this weekend, I think mainly from the Roto World community, that was saying, here's Adrian Peterson's film. Don't compare anybody to Adrian Peterson. Right. Would you be willing to compare him to Adrian Peterson? Definitely, yes. It's not – is – again, it's not going to be as violent as, like – collisions like that yeah peterson just had people popping off of him. but he's gonna have way he's gonna have kick return pass receiving clips that adrian peterson never had and he's gonna have every bit as exciting as some of the long runs and making people miss in space and like listen the big ten's real guys like the big ten this is no longer like the big ten from eight years ago where nobody ran four or five in the whole conference the big ten now has ohio state and michigan and iowa and wisconsin and a bunch of guys that can go and he's running by all of them and they can't catch him mm. and it doesn't matter oh washington the bowl game uh see you later no. Uh, do you want – I've watched some of these big running backs. Should I save that till Wednesday? But I can just tell you this from what I've seen to this point. Barkley is on a different planet than almost any running back in the history of the sport. So to say Geis, who I've watched already, no, I'm, I'm, with all due respect to Connor, it's, yeah. it's they're not in the same planet. But Saquon is that next level. Next level. Yeah. And the Browns did the right thing. They came out and said, look, we might take him at one because in a year where you have a guy like that – I believe it's the role of the team that has the first pick to say, we're going to take him and then threaten every other team that you have to trade up to get that guy. I don't know if he gets past two. I don't know if he gets past one. I, I You certainly have to think about it. He's worthy of the wow. number one pick in the draft. And if you're the Browns and you go, okay, there's like maybe we like two quarterbacks. Do you really think the Giants are going to take a quarterback? You I know, want to talk about the Browns. You got to weigh all that in. You know, it's going to be interesting. All right, so I want to move to quarterbacks, though. Quarterbacks. Uh, just because it's the draft of quarterbacks, and you texted me on like Friday and said this is a great year because you have five guys. I like four of the five. Right. I think they're going to be good players in the NFL. Um, but I, I think what I want to do. Who's your other? Who's the one you don't? I'll tell you in a little bit. But when uh, 
when I when I look at this draft, I really in the next few weeks I want to focus on the quarterbacks because mm-hmm. a lot of franchises are going to be different, and I think that you're going to become the quarterback evaluator for the next decade. Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna shoot my shot right now. I'm gonna predict something. I think in the next five ten years, you're gonna be like, oh that's cool. Oh you like those two quarterbacks? Let me just see what Sims has to say about these guys. <laughs> and I want to say before we get in, you said last week. You had Lamar Jackson and Josh Allen at one level. You had Baker Mayfield kind of at the bottom end of that level. Yeah, they're in the, yeah, they're all in the same tier. And then Rosen and Darnold at the next tier. Right. I don't have any doubt that it's going to flip and change. Mm-hmm. But I want to say that Sims and Lefko is becoming Lam- Team Lamar Jackson. Right. Not saying blindly that he is going to be the best quarterback, but we want to support Lamar Jackson because I don't think there's been a player that represents what this podcast stands for more than Lamar Jackson. And here's what I mean. We call ourselves the Players Podcast. He is being so disrespected that as the players podcast i feel the need to stand up for yeah we do number two article four section three we comment on social issues when we need to yeah we believe that lamar jackson is being judged differently solely because he's a black quarterback certainly a big part of it yes it's it's a different evaluation so we're going to comment on social issues and the third one is that we believe that not enough people actually watch the tape and they rely on the opinions of others and i think that if they watch the tape of lamar jackson and not just when oh he's fast and he's black well then we're not going to we're not going to do it. So I think Lamar Jackson is like the quarterback representation of what this podcast stands for. And I think that's why we are team Lamar Jackson. But I'll be honest. I moved Josh Allen ahead of him after what I watched at the combine. I get it. I but, get it. But we are team Lamar Jackson. We are team Lamar Jackson. I'm not getting off that bandwagon. Listen, it's really close. I think Josh Allen and Baker Mayfield, of course, help themselves. You could just see it goes back to what we've been saying. They're just natural throwers of the football. They can pick that thing up and throw it around, right? Let me give you let me give you my yeah. Lefko reads of watching it, and yeah. you tell me if I'm stupid or if I got it. Cool. We'll start off with Josh Allen. I wrote he's enormous, like as a human. Yes. Like I was just like like his arms and his legs yeah. and like everything about him it's is just is natural enormous. big, right? His deep throws are effortless, right? Like, I feel like he threw it 70, he could have thrown it 90. Yeah, it sounds like he can throw it 90. His deep balls are just a beautiful mix. Like, it doesn't hang too long, and it pushes out great. And I love the fact that he played under center. Mm -hmm. So what was your evaluation of watching Josh Allen at the combine? What was the Chris Sims official evaluation? Yeah, well, I I mean, you're right about the under the center thing. I think that you have to start there. That's what I liked about Carson Wentz coming out, too, because it's that same type of offense. You get to see them in a lot of pro-style schemes. That's encouraging. So that takes that question out of the way right away. But the biggest thing for me, and I know I said it last week, he's got the strongest arm I've ever seen. I mean, ever. It's it's unreal. Um, but the thing I like the most is the fact that I saw a little bit of a different motion at the combine than I saw on film, really? which tells me that, okay, he's already corrected some of his issues. The, the motion was tighter. He kept his arm angle more at that 90-degree angle that I talk about so much. Um, so – to me, that was the big thing. I never saw a wobble out of some of the Not passes. Not a single wobble. No. And, you know, again, I go a little bit, but like, what, just listen to the David Carr. Listen to David Carr. He was shocked. Right. Shocked. Like, oh, he can just wait there and let the guy go 50 yards downfield before he throws it. And then he throws it. Oh, it's there. Uh, yes. So and that I like tells David you, Carr. Well, David Carr, he's been around the block. He's a first round. He's the first I player say this. picked, I and think he can throw it. I, it's, I feel like you and David Carr are very similar in terms of, like, what you've had to deal with and, like, the bullshit and all that. And sure. Every time I listen to David Carr, I agree with him. Yeah. Well, he does his work. I yeah. mean, that's the, I, the one thing I know when I would turn on David Carr, we might not always agree, but I go, he's watched. I can tell he's watched, and he has, like, some factual opinions behind that to make his points that I like. Right. So you came away, Josh Allen, more impressed? (sighs) Yeah, more impressed. Uh, Yes, definitely more impressed. Um, Yeah, it makes it that much closer between him and Lamar, certainly, during that conversation. And Baker Mayfield, I think, is – He's officially in that conversation as well. I mean, So yeah. just to finish up Josh Allen, right. he was asked, who do you model your game after? And he said, I don't really model my game after anyone, but the guy that I watch the most is Aaron Rodgers. Hmm. And I went, shit. <laughs> Josh. Our favorite quarterback is oh. Josh Allen. <laughs> oh, man. But no, because I, I, apparently Josh, like they'll do drills where they're like, he's just running around and they throw. And he immediately has to learn how to throw from weird angles. And that's... There's a number of throws where he's literally he getting so tackled and he throws balls that are like 20-yard out routes. Now we'll do Lamar Jackson. Sure. 
I wrote down, it's a really easy thrower. Yeah. His wrist snap is crazy. Mm -hmm. I thought he was inaccurate. Mm -hmm. I thought he had deep ball issues, just chronically underthrowing it. I saw a lot of bad spirals, and I thought he looked nervous. Yeah. That was what I watched from him. Yes. Played it careful. Played it way too careful. And and it, I do knock him down for it. I mean, I'm not going to say he's my number two right now, but it is concerning. You know, I, I wanted to see him go out there and let it go like you see on film. I mean, everybody talks about it that's seen him in person and throw it, how he can really spin it and his arm is ultra strong, and the film justifies it. You know, I don't have any doubt about it. But, yes, he played it careful from all, all facets too, not only the throwing. So the throwing, he didn't really throw any balls with power, and because of that, he never really slotted his arm the right way. So you're right, the ball wobbled a lot of the time through like what we would call tight wobblers. And then also, his dra- he didn't let his drop go either. He tried to play it so relaxed and be good yeah, he that just he didn't get aggressive there. with his legs like you see too. So all of that, yes, it did piss me off as I was watching it. And it made me go back to also the problem of he needs to get an agent. He needs to have an agent relaying his message out there. I know Mama Jackson is probably an awesome woman. I don't deny that or even question that. Yeah. But you need the agent. This weekend's the perfect example. Why? Because when idiots say things that he should play wide receiver, you have the agent that's going to go to the media outlets and defend Lamar Jackson and go, well, no, this is what we're being told by teams. We're being told he's going to be a top 20 pick, a quarterback. Right. You feed a reporter a story that three teams love him at quarterback. Right. And then that way you don't have to say anything, but the story gets out. He there. has to. Then we, everybody, we're all manipulatable. Yes. I don't think that's a word. But it might be. Manipulable? We, or I don't know. We can all be manipulated. Yes. And he has no one manipulating for him. No. And that's why I kind of want to be the podcast that manipulates for him. Yeah, I hear you. Well, I think we're going to have to a little bit. But uh, was it uh, annoying and concerning? Yes, a little bit. But, again, it's not going to erase the other 400 throws that I saw. Of course. Where I just throw, saw him throw piss missiles all over the field. And I said, holy shit, that's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, he had a few that were, like, pretty impressive well, he can th- just he wasn't c- consistent he can he can really really throw it that's what's yeah. disappointing i mean that's 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 really all it comes down to at the end of the day i also think he dropped the ball by not running the 40 he could have blown it out of the water i mean josh allen was the fastest quarterback or the, who was it the other kid uh no it's josh allen yeah okay so i mean that would have looked really good except four three seven as one quarterback and then the next guy's four seven five yeah that would have like caught people's attention other thing I want to say, too, that just annoys me about the conversation a little bit with Lamar Jackson. Sure. Get it. The throwing was not great. But this is what annoys me, too, okay? Because, again, Josh Rosen, he's the most polished thrower of the group, let's right. say, right? And I know you're going to break him down here in a second. But nobody says anything that he goes one for six on out routes and post corners and goes two for three on slants, one of which he skipped on the ground. The yes, second one was a great catch at the guy's feet. You're right. But nothing gets said. There's no <laughs> – see, he dribbled it on the ground. If Lamar did that, they'd be like, oh, see, this is what we're concerned about. I saw a throw seven years ago on a film, and he threw the ball like that. I don't know if I can draft him. And that drives me fucking crazy because yeah. there's one guy that gets away with something and another guy that doesn't, and we don't hold everybody to the same standards. And You're that right. Annoys Josh me. Rosen did have some. Let's and, go to Baker next, though. Yeah. I wrote good spiral, pretty good placement. Yeah. Uh, ball jumps out of his hands. Mm-hmm. Uh, it took some effort on deep throws. But I just thought what was interesting, too, is when they did his height, weight, hand 40, do you know who the comp was? No. Case Keenum. Huh. And I went, I could see that, but I think he's a stronger arm than Case. I do too. But I, think I like, he's a better natural quarterback too, but go I, ahead. I think he the ball looks pretty coming out of Baker's yeah, hands. He, he's a gifted thrower, man. Yeah. Those those three, you know, uh, Rosen, who I was saying is the most polished of them as a thrower, still like Mayfield, Allen, and Lamar Jackson make the best combination of accuracy with power throws down the field. Yes. And Mayfield, hey, he's an he's a high level thrower of the football. I don't care what his size is or whatever it is. He is an elite arm. He does. It's gonna be in the top half of the starters, top ten in the NFL right off the bat as far as how how much he can push the ball down the field, not only with like deep deep balls, but just with power and pace on deep in cuts and comebacks. And I'll just say this too. The other thing, again, is the fucking combine, okay? Yeah. I mean, 
Oh, we're going to go off 20 let's, throws. Let's throw three throws and then go stand back there for 10 minutes and come back and throw another. Oh, hey, 20 board throws. I got them down now. I got 20 board throws to people you've never thrown to before with a coach teaching them how to run routes that you have no fucking clue how he's really teaching them. Yeah. And you've never thrown to these guys. So, again, the combine throwing thing is one of the jokes to me. And I know it's a, it's a joke to a lot of people in sure. the NFL. You just really go to go, let me see him in person and let me just see it come out of his hand a little bit, and the that's all perfect, you can do. The perfect story is J.P. Losman. Sure. If you really want to know what mm-hmm. throwing at the combine means, Eli Manning went out and worked out, and then J.P. Losman from Tulane came out there and purposely threw right after him, and people went, wow, this guy could wing it. The Bills took him in the first round, mm-hmm. and we never heard from him again. Never again. Uh, I will say this, though, about Baker, and I have all the information from the quarterbacks, too. I did the same thing compared him to former years. Yeah. He just wasn't as fast and as explosive as I thought he was going to be. Yeah, I told you last week, didn't I tell you that? So when you run, when Josh you run, Allen is faster than him. That's of course, what I thought. when he yeah. runs though a four eight four right. and has a twenty nine inch vert, he has a, sm- a, a smaller vert than Josh Rosen and the same broad jump as Josh Rosen. I went, man, I thought that was a part of Baker's game that was there, and it's not. Yeah, no, he's better in the pocket than you think he is. Because we don't think that because he's a smaller guy. Right. He's quick. And, and he's he can, got quickness. But, right. yes, he does not run away from anybody. No. And, and, then, and, 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 I, and I know I said that last week. You said that during the Georgia I, game. I, I think, and I also said, I think, you know, if you him and Josh Allen race, Josh Allen's going to just beat him. But Josh Allen's a much, much bigger man. Um, Sam Darnold. Not throwing. Does that do anything to you or not? Well, it, it just shows you that he's he's definitely conscious of the fact that he did not want to be measured next to Allen and Mayfield and their natural throwing and then have and people Rosen. sit there, look at him, and go, oh, well, look at his motion and how he drops the ball. He did not want to have a negative something dissected over the next few weeks, and that would have been dissected, especially because he was going to be in the group, I believe, with uh, Mayfield and Allen. He wasn't going to be with Rosen. Right. And so, and in terms of athlete, right. slower than Mayfield. Right. The, the smallest vertical of I went back and I put Dak, Goff, Wentz, Mahomes, Watson, Trubisky on this chart as well. Right. I'm going to give you one as well. Yeah. What's actually? I don't even think I. Sam Darnold had worse than all of them. He had a worse broad jump than he had the worst broad jump out of the whole list. He had the worst vertical jump in the whole list, and his 40 was worse than everybody except for Josh Rosen. And he had the smallest hands, right? And no. At three A's. Oh, Goff has a little smaller. Yeah, his hands are the smallest of the guys this year, I believe. No, Baker Mayfield's smaller. Is it where the hell? So is he? that that was a oh, question yeah. that I have for you though is, Josh Rosen went out there, and I'm just gonna be honest. When I saw him roll, like throwing the football and rolling around and doing these drills, and your big knock was that he's not as athletic as yeah. Darnold and Mayfield. Right. I think he's just as athletic as those guys. He's not. I'm just going to tell you. He's just smooth. <laughs> he's smooth running around, smooth and it's a shit. little sneakier than you think. Yes. And he's huge. But it's a build-up you're not, speed. I don't, I don't know if you're giving I – I just don't feel like you give Rosen credit for how big he is. Well, I know. He's he's, he's 200. 6'4", 226. He's bigger than Mayfield and Darnold. Yeah. He ran – his 40 wasn't that much slower, and he's got a better – like, he explodes better. No, listen, I get it, but, but again – you know why do I think he looks more athletic and you think he's less? Well, because he's smoother. I think if you saw film with people running around him, like he does it effortlessly, and it's easy for him. But he's not actually going anywhere a lot of the time. And then it's foot quickness in general that scares me. Just so the he's ability a little to bit slower with his feet, but he's maybe a long strider. When he, when he opens up and gets out on the edge, you go, oh, he can run a little bit. But, but he can't. It can't movements. be sudden. And it can't be hopping around the pocket and then let me make a weird throw from a weird angle because my feet are all up. Oh, I can pop them back into place real quick. That would be the issue there. You know what else I loved about Josh Rosen? Yeah. When they were talking about how he was a tennis prodigy growing up. Sure. And I thought about how you said that most quarterbacks should play tennis. Yes. And I was like, this guy does everything that Sims wants. And Sims got him at number five. I like him. He's a tennis prodigy. You know I like him. I like all of these guys. I yeah. really do. And I, I could very easily, like I said, flip him and Sam Darnold. I mean, really, uh, you know, I've been watching some USC guys, too. It, it, I might flip them. I don't really know. I mean, Sam, I, that's the one guy I don't so like. So, Sam Darnold. The one guy I don't like is Sam Darnold. Well, uh, I mean. He's got the longest motion. He's the worst athlete. He played on the team with the most weapons around the him and the best body. offensive line. He's got the worst body. Yeah. I 
I, I just think that all the other guys have a lot of pluses, and Sam Darnold is, is that he threw for 450 yards against Penn State in that bowl game, and people are still obsessed with it. That's me, and I haven't watched as much as 90% of the people out there. I get you. No, but I think there's part of that. He's USC. He's a Southern Cal kid. He's cool. Everybody likes him, and I understand that he's got like the team likes him, all yeah. that stuff. So that, that's all. That's good stuff. So we know they that. Said the same thing about Sanchez. And, and he the same can thing about, and, and he can make it happen. You know, off schedule, which players like. You know, players on a team like that. He like, does oh, have that a lot. more. He does than have that. that. But that's the part I question. Now again, is that the way he plays? Is like, oh, he got out of the pocket against Arizona. Oh, Arizona, all those good D linemen on Arizona? Uh, oh, I mean, none of them are in the draft, right? So the way he plays, it worries me about whether that's conducive to the NFL. Okay, that would be my first thing. Nick, you ain't running away from anybody exactly, at a 4A5. At four, exactly right. That's, he's not running away. And I would even say that's a little bit with Baker, too. That would be one of my questions a little bit, that the way they play – could be a little bit of a different shot. This is what happened with Johnny Manziel. Right. But man, but he, this kid's better in the pocket, and he's a better pure thrower than Manziel. Are you talking about Mayfield? Mayfield is, yeah. yes. Darnold is a better thrower than his motion looks like. But again, it's reckless. The game's all over the place. It's a freewheeling, let me scramble. The first guy's not open. I'm going to run out of the pocket. I, again, it's the part of the problem that annoys me with the Lamar Jackson conversation. Because again, if you're He's talking about playing the, comp- yeah. the the position from the pure standpoint of being a pocket passer and making smart decisions, well, Sam Darnold's the worst one at that. He's the worst. He doesn't take care of the football. He fumbles the most. He threw interceptions, led the nation in fumbles. He is by far the one I saw with the most dropped interceptions on film too. So yeah, that's my pick. That's the one guy I don't like. But I'm I just, just gonna. I, just I don't get that. I get, I get it. I get it. Uh, I found when you look at that chart, mm-hmm. Josh Allen and Carson Wentz. It's just hard not to compare these guys. Yeah, I know. They're the same height. They're the same weight. Their hand size is nearly identical. Their 40 times are nearly identical. Josh Allen outjumped Wentz by three inches and one more inch on the broad, but they're nearly identical yeah. in everything. I thought that Rosen is a better athlete than Darnold Mayfield, and I thought Darnold was easily the most disappointing. But when you look at them, I mean, it's a good group of athletes overall compared to the rest. It is. It's a good group of guys all together. They're all – First round quarterbacks worthy of that status. It's going to be great discussing this as we continue to go on. It, I'm telling you, it's the first time in a long in a long time that I'm going to go back and watch them all again at some point. You have to. Yeah, it's the first time ever. I, you, I mean, years past, I've been like Jameis Winston, Mark. I'm done. I'm never going to look at them again. I already know. You know who they are. I know who they are. Same with last year, Mahomes, Watson, Trubisky. I watched them. You know, I watched them once thoroughly, and yeah. I was like, I know it. I'm good. What's so funny is I'm watching the NFL Network, and they put up the comp for Josh Rosen. Mm-hmm. Who do you think was the NFL player that most matched height, weight? And hand size for Josh Rosen. It wasn't golf for anybody? It was Jacoby Brissett. <laughs> and the NFL Network guys were like, I don't think so. When I see Jacoby, he's like a really big guy, and he's kind of stands there like Peyton Manning. And I'm like, that's Josh Rosen. Yeah. Josh Rosen is the guy that stands there, and he's really big, right. and he stands in the pocket. And I, I – yeah, they, they couldn't handle it. They wanted to compare him to Trent Green. And I was like, no, I, I see – Jacoby Brissett. Jacoby Brissett stands there in the pocket forever. No doubt about and it. And never runs. Yes. I could see him being Jacoby. I uh, I wouldn't be shocked. I right? Mean, yeah. He's not as good an athlete as Jacoby, but he is definitely a, a better pure passer. I'm not going to say his arm's stronger than Jacoby, but right. it's not far off. It's close. The other players that stood out there at the combine, mm-hmm. uh, Bradley Chubb. He goes out there at 6'4", 269, runs a 4'6", 5". Uh, man, it really made me appreciate Miles Garrett, though. Yeah. Miles Garrett put up nine more reps on the bench, five inches more on the vert, and seven inches more on the broad jump, but we're calling Chubb a freak. You know, and that's how great Miles Garrett was. Well, I know. I mean, Miles Garrett was one of those guys that I I, I promised you by the tenth play. I said he's the first pick of the draft. The yeah. tenth play, like I, I was. There's no doubt. But in this class of not a lot of pass rushers, right. Bradley Chubb will be top seven because he's the only one. Yes, I mean he might be number that. three. Indianapolis Colts. They need a player like this. He this kid's legit though. I mean he's a good football player all around. I've seen him in person when they played against Notre Dame, North Carolina State. He is. Uh, 
he is a guy that you can I think you can depend on him being like right in that double digit sack uh, output on a year to year basis. He can be a guy that can get you 10, 12 sacks every year. And then also you don't have to worry about like, oh, we got to orchestrate the defense because he doesn't stop the run game. No, he's a full on really good football player and has it all really has no weakness. I think the left favorite player mm-hmm. raised his head this weekend and his name is Tremaine Edmonds. Yeah the linebacker from Mm -hmm. Virginia Tech. There are certain times where you're watching the combine and you go, who is this alien that has come down to participate in these drills? He's our kind of alien. 6'5", Respectfully. We mean that in a respectful way. You're a very nice diplomatic alien, Traymond Edmonds. 6'5", 253, 45440, looked fluid everywhere, and he's 19 years old. Mm Mm-hmm. 19, which means the kid might still grow. And that was a funny point in the telecast, too, because when he ran the 40 and Mayock goes, you know, I really can't think of a pro pilot comparison. And Daniel Jeremiah goes, you know, I was thinking it was Anthony Barr. And when he said Anthony Barr, I was like, that's spot on. It is that's perfect. who the guy is. And Mayock didn't say anything. I just thought it was funny because he was like, I don't know if he, I don't know what happened. But, uh, oh, because you think he was trying to make a point. Well, I Daniel... don't think he had thought Anthony Barr. And then Dar- Daniel Jeremiah said it, and he didn't know how to respond to it. Like, oh, yeah, I didn't think of that. He Trayman Edmer, Tremaine Edwards to Edmonds to me is the perfect example of a guy that for years would have been forced to play outside pass rusher. Oh, yeah, and, DN. Na- and now we're at a time where we're like, no, put the athlete in the middle of the field in space and let him chase people. Stop yes. putting him up against Jason Peters right. and getting his ass kicked. I can tell you just from personal experience of playing guys like a Brian Urlacher. When you have a guy like this, or Keith Bullock, remember Keith Bullock back in the day from your Syracuse team? Yes. Keith Bullock was the same way. I'm not saying they were quite quite as fast as Tremaine Edmonds, but that size at the middle linebacker position from athletic guys who have long arm spans, it is a pain in the ass for a quarterback. I can't even imagine. It's daunting thinking about throwing the ball down the middle of the field. Exactly right. Oh, it's going to get tipped. Oh, he's faster than you think. Yeah. He's going to get, you know, he's going to break on the ball. He's got nothing behind him to worry about. He's just waiting for me to throw it underneath and come and kill my running back. Yeah. Whatever it may be. But there's great value in these guys. Nick, make sure the audio is going. Uh, this happened today. Uh, we are uh, the. We are the Players Podcast. We are Team Lamar Jackson. And you also know that we love good white boy Supremes. Yes. And there was a white boy Supreme named Troy Apke from Penn State that ran today. I just want you to listen to Deion Sanders' reaction. This is the reason we talk about white boy Supremes. This is Troy Apke. Oh, man, he can run. Why are you surprised, Dan? Oh, uh, you know why I'm surprised. I can't see it on TV, but he can run, run. <laughs> he, he was can a run, track run. guy. Right. He was a track guy. But, but you're saying it with an You don't tone. see that much. You're saying it in tone. Let's call it what it is. I like that, He man. just ran 4-3-5. Hey, man, I mean, go hug at him. At 215 <laughs> pounds. He ended up being 200 pounds. He's like, man, I got to go hug him. Yeah, I love it. I love it. But look. But re- why can't he just say because he's white and white safeties don't exist that much? Like, what is the fucking fat, problem with saying that white. this day and age anymore? Were there any other players that jumped out to you that you'd like to focus on? Oh, gosh. Um, let me just think real quick. quick. Oh, I'll tell you one guy that jumped out to me right yeah. off the bat. And it's just a guy because I've seen him in person, and I do think he's going to be a hell of a – this is the Lorenzo Carter kid from Georgia. Now, he was a huge recruit. He's an outside linebacker slash defensive end. He is a really good football player. He plays in that, like, you know, that uh, three, four Nick Saban type of scheme where he doesn't always get to attack. It's more like in New England where they're going to read the offense and hold people up. But he's a guy that I would say watch out for. I mean, 6'6", 250, ran 4'5", vertical 36. I've seen him in person. He's a man. Yeah. He's a myth. He's a beast. Talk I about mean, Rashad Penny, too. Oh, uh, th- San Diego sure. State running back. Yes. So it's funny. So Sims walks in. Sims does not go online. So the best part is, is Sims is never stealing people's opinions, <laughs> and he has no idea what other people's opinions are. And he comes in and he goes, Lefko, this kid Rashad Penny from San Diego State, it's wild. And I went, did you read the article from Roto World? He goes, I don't even know what Roto World is. Right. They, they did a thing where they, they chart certain statistics that yeah. they believe has a direct co- correlation to success. Right. And number two under Saquon was Rashad Penny. Yeah. And the comment was, 
I don't know who this kid is. I need to look at him. Yeah. You. What did you see that made you even bring him up? Well, he's a height speed, like a height speed weight guy, a height speed weight guy. Height where weight I just, speed. just from the simple fact of the way he looked and the forty time he looked, I he's on my list. I don't give a shit. Like if he had three carries for four yards career, I gotta see him. I gotta look at it. He popped. Yes, he popped. So. And then you put on the film. I put on the film, and I mean, do you, that's what I was gonna say. Do you want to go through the running back breakdowns right no, now? I, I, well, no, I kind of want kid you to. Is, this kid, watch out for this. This kid he's going to be in the conversation for one of the top running backs taken i can already tell you that i haven't even gotten in that deep i'm only like a game in but i like what i see big has quick feet a little bit of a narrow base for a big guy but the speed is there for a big guy he can go 90 yards to the house mm. he can make people miss in space uh now pass protection was a little yeah. underwhelming, but yeah, I, I look forward to breaking these guys down on the on our podcast that comes out Thursday. Awesome. Uh, let's talk about really quick before we go the Brown situation. Yeah, because I think that is the most fascination fascinating in the draft, especially when we're coming out of the combine. They're sitting at one and four. Yeah. Here are the stories that came out this week. Mm-hmm. One, Hugh Jackson prefers AJ McCarron, which we kind of knew that, and then two that they are legitimately thinking about Saquon at one and Baker Mayfield at four. And that's sort of what they're looking at. I think it is the role, like I said before, of the first pick in the draft to say we want the best player so that other teams need to trade up for him. How do they balance? Because my first thought today was why not go for an A.J. McCarron? Why not go for a Nick Foles or a Teddy Bridgewater and get a Saquon at one and a Chubb at four, a Saquon at one and a Minka at four? You know what I mean? Like, why not go? And now this is a draft where there's four or five really good quarterbacks. Yeah. But – I, I don't know. Well, I know. I you mean, got the money those, to pay the quarterback. The, you're right. I mean, all those theories are good. It, you know, again, it, it's one thing we do in this business a little bit is it, free agency is going to dictate a lot of how this plan of attack we goes. We always do this. I know. Yes. Right. So, you know, we again, never wait for free agency to end before we start figuring out who people should draft. Right. So uh, let's see what goes on and shakes out there for them at that point. But, yeah, they are in an interesting spot, too. I mean, it's going to be about who they like at the quarterback position. I did think it was funny. I think it kind of squeaked out during the combine this weekend, too, that Hugh Jackson really liked Carson Wentz coming out. Oh, really? Yeah, and then it must have not really it been his decision, been, yeah. right, that he couldn't he couldn't trump it. But when they lost that GM, yeah. I figured every bad decision in the last two years was, was going to be put on No, 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 no. Oh, put on him. Put on him. Right. When you get fired, you could blame that guy for anything. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the toilets weren't working? Yeah, it was that old analytics motherfucker. <laughs> that stupid idiot. Yeah. Uh, but – but, I mean, Lefko, you're right. It's it's going to be – the Cleveland Saquon. Browns are going to have to balance out what they think the Giants and Colts are going to do too. And are they really looking to trade those picks? And that's the stuff that they're going to really have to do their homework on right. and see because that's going to really determine a lot of what they can do as far as – where they can draft a quarterback at one or four. So the, I don't think the Colts are drafting a quarterback. So that kind of gives them a little bit of yes. hope. And it sounds well, the Giants but they worry are about the Cardinals or somebody else Someone coming trading up. up. Right. There's no way that Saquon lasts till four, right? I don't think there's any way that Josh Allen lasts until four. But, th- but that I don't know. Actually, any of the quarterbacks could last until four. Do you think Bradley Chubb could last till four? He could. Right. I just think the only guy is Saquon. And I feel like if I'm just going based off of odds, I want to get the guy that I know is is not going to be there. And then at four, you could always trade up again. You know what I mean? They, they definitely have the picks stockpiled to do that. The I mean, question, they could go one and two, really. The, the question is, is if their board is, let's say, Saquon one, Josh Allen two, you know, how, so how would you negotiate it? Because it is still a running back versus a quarterback in terms of position of value. I know. Um, What's your gut right now? My gut is you have to go for the quarterback, the one that you think the, the he's the prize possession. Mm. He's the guy that can influence your – uh, organization in a greater way with greater impact and for a longer period of time on top of that. And I think that's where the value is there. Yeah, uh, you, you got to go to the quarterback. Uh, I'm not putting it out, though, that the fact that uh, I guess if the Colts are at three, man, what would the Colts do? I guess they would probably – would they take Saquon Barkley at number three if they're sitting there? And, like, let's say the Browns go Josh Allen one. And then the Giants go – I don't even know what the Giants are going to do. I don't know what the the Giants in my gut is telling me they're trying to trade back. Mm. 
That's really what my gut tells me with the Giants. Just, I don't get the feeling that they're really in it for the quarterback, and that's not going to happen. Yeah, I, I look at the Browns and I go, if you end up with Saquon and one of the quarterbacks, one of your top two guys, that's great. If you end up with Josh Allen and let's say it goes Saquon Chubb and you end up with like Josh Allen Minka or Josh Allen and then another top position, sure. that's good too. Yeah, I think the Browns are in a good position. They are in a great position. But – Man, I just, you know, if you got Saquon there and you really, really hey, want him. I can't even say enough about Sa- Saquon. That's special, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's that special. It's, it's, it's as good as I've ever seen. What do you think about people that aren't that high on them? I don't even understand what they're watching. I mean, they have to be watching. See, they have to be. See, to me, yeah, like, what could they be they're focusing They're watching the on? games that are low stat outputs. And they're blaming him for the O line not blocking people. I actually they're heard going, this. Well, why couldn't he blo- get through those five guys that are around him and surrounding him that are all 285 pounds and dr- strong as hell? Why couldn't he get out of that? Someone I heard someone saying that the, the the knock against Saquon right now is that a lot of his games are three 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 sixty three three three, and they don't they want it to be more like eight 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 twenty. He's not a he's not the sledgehammer Ezekiel Elliott and Leonard Fournette. If there's one weakness to him, yes, he's not going to just go. I'm going to put my head down and try to run you over. He kind of looks for the home run a little bit more, but 3-3-3-80 three, 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 is still pretty good. And see what they're not doing that's is – That's why you compare him to Todd Gurley. Though. Well, but the, exactly. But that's also – they're not they're not taking into account what he can do. He, like, is a legit receiver. Like, those other guys were not. Like, they could catch the ball out of the backfield. Right. Saquon Barkley can be like – you can put him at slot receiver and go – Oh, they got the linebacker on him. We're going to Saquon on the option route or the go route. I've seen it all through the whole year. Yeah. So, he's- What's funny is a lot of times we talk about prospects and you try and compare them to other people. You go, oh, well, he's not as good as that. But with Saquon, I feel like we compare him to someone and we say that other person's not as good. So we go, oh, so he's as good a receiver as Le'Veon Bell. And then you go, yeah, but Le'Veon's not as quick or as fast as he is. No. And then you go, okay, well, so he's as good a receiver as Kamara. And you go, look, so he's just on a different world of, of physicality than Kamara. Right. Okay, so, oh, he's fast like Zeke. And you're like, yeah, but I don't know, man. But he's better in space and Faster than Zeke. Right. And then you go, okay, well, he's like Fournette. And you're like, look, Fournette just can't catch the ball like he can. It's so funny. Like, that's how highly we can regard Saquon that these greats don't have the things that he has. Yeah. Not the other way around. Yeah. I, I mean, just from big play capabilities, the the explosion, the acceleration, the quickness, they're off the charts. They're off the charts. And his highlight runs are yeah, you know, now that you brought up Adrian Peterson, he might be the only guy I could sit there and go, man, it's probably he's probably wow. got a few better than him, but it's it's really close. We are going to figure out what Sims is breaking down Wednesday. It sounds like you're really hopped up on running backs. Well, so I kind of was like... starting. I'm kind of you know knee deep in them right yeah. now, so I'll finish them. And then, what do you want me to go to next? We'll what two positions out. do you want to go? Don't, on we Wednesday? don't have to do it on the podcast. Okay, fine. Uh, but coming up right now, it is going to be actor, director, and all around awesome dude that busts my balls, Peter Berg. Uh, Peter, we are actually going to be picking this right in the middle of him talking about method man joining him on the set of copland and what happened good there. movie so uh four sims peace out homies fendrick would say good evening and the l-e-f-k-o-e man we'll now pass to peter berg talking about the m-e-t-h-o-d man all right enjoy on, on, a, on a rooftop i played a cop and they were looking for and i, I ended up getting thrown off the rooftop and right. killed uh, and they were looking for like some you know guy to throw me up the rooftop, and I just worked with Method Man, so I kind of knew who he was and yeah. what the Wu Tang crew was. Um, so I told the director James Mangold, I'm like, we should hire this guy Method Man, and he's like, you know, it's just one little scene. He's like, okay, I, so, but I think he's kind of famous, like yeah, like you, cause we were filming it in Harlem up on this rooftop, and uh, and he's like, okay, he's famous. I'm like, I'm just telling you, I think he's kind yeah. of. And so we get there, <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, you, you have like a motorhome, but I had half a motorhome. So one half is a Peter Berg, and the other half, this is in, you know, broad daylight in Harlem. It's a method man. And so the within line like, starts for Yeah, it. within like 15 minutes of getting there, there were like 500 people. And then we went up on the roof, and I remember <laughs> we were filming, we heard this like commotion. Yeah. We looked down, there's thousands of people. There's cops on horses, wow. like riots, and and James Mangold, the director, is like, "What's going? What? What? I go, I told, I told you, you he's to, kind of famous. I told you. So yeah, <laughs> that's Met, awesome. Method Man throws me off. The, yeah, yeah, that's right. The roof. If, yep, and you're dead. 
And then those corrupt New York cops. <laughs> Yeah, there's some bad cops in that movie. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to start right now, if you're cool with it. Well, let's do it. Uh, oh, I we thought have, we started. Yeah, I think yeah. we did, too. I hope we did. I hope we were rolling. Hope we, were rolling. Uh, we have director, producer, writer, actor. You've seen him a ton, and his work is awesome. His name is Peter Berg. Uh, you were just saying that you used to watch with your dad, Sims and, and uh, Sims's dad, playing football. So, yeah, I grew up um, watching games starting at Yankee Stadium. Yeah, damn. Uh, <clears throat> so Whoa, don't I, date yourself. I saw, I saw Fred Tarkenton play. I was actually in my mom's stomach. At Giant, Giants games at Yankee Stadium, <laughs> and uh, in in I don't until your your dad came around. I don't think we'd ever won a playoff game. Mo most of my my youth was spent just watching horrible, horrible right. Giants teams. And my son has now you know been to two Super Bowls. Unreal. And it, it really is amazing how that like affects your outlook on life. You know, when you you're a young kid and and congratulations Thank you. to you too. But I agree, my <clears throat> life outlook has completely right. changed. Well, <laughs> and, but imagine if you're really oh. young. So for my son to see like, you know, the David Tyree catch or you know, the the Wes Welker drop. Right. Yes. Um right. you know these these you you really actually get this feeling that anything in life can happen and right. it, you know and it, it makes a huge difference so i try and tell my son how lucky he was because he didn't have to sit through so many years of giants suffering uh, yeah just brutal suffering but um yes yeah, my dad and i used to it's watch awesome your dad and you, so. cuz i grew up watching you whether it was 21 jump street mm -hmm. or old movies in the late 80s early 90s it's crazy it really is uh but let's just make sure though we gang up on left golf screw the eagles okay yeah, we're done so it's much. over he the was anniversary is over I respectfully <laughs> give you some credit yeah but it's, it's a, over That's so it. my tickets to the game i was right in front of tish right and he leans over and he's i think i told you he's like talking to my mom the entire time and we couldn't see the challenges on the field and tish leans over goes i just want you to know i hate you but that was a catch and i was like thank you man i appreciate steve? it yeah I'm steve that's but, nice. but yeah. i think what's funny is is i had a few people in this office go isn't it good that everyone from the NFC East has now won a Super Bowl? And I almost wanted to go, no, no, no. I want to keep this rivalry. Like, I like the Giants-Eagles rivalry. Yeah, it's going like, to just make it better, so don't yeah. worry. And it, it's supposed to be like that. The NFC East, I feel like, is where football started, at least in my, at least the NFL. Do, do That's you have like thoughts on, on what, yeah. what the Giants are going to do? I, I don't. It sounds like, I mean, I have thoughts. I have plenty of thoughts. What would you do? What I would, would draft mind? a quarterback at number two and who, then try who, to emulate. Who, who would you who would If you, you made me pick a guy, I, I'm studying all these guys right now. Mm -hmm. I think if right now the number one guy I would go with is Josh Allen. Mm -hmm. He would be the guy I would go with. Uh, and if you want to keep an Eli around, it, it, Josh Allen's the perfect guy to sit behind him for a year or two. He's a little raw. He needs to clean up right. a few things, but he has big time talent. Right. I think yeah. you're, I agree. I All think right. that's what'll happen. But so. it, I, don't, I, I don't know if it's going to happen. That's what I'm concerned about. I, I have a feeling they're going to try to. Appease, use these resources appease, to give Eli, Eli exactly. That's what bothers me as a true Giant fan and somebody that roots for the best interest right. of the organization. I just go, damn, I like Eli. You yeah, know I, I do. I, I think, just, it's time to move on. I think when when Eli got benched and the whole McAdoo right. you know, was, I, yeah. I think clearly ownership was aware of that. Like yes. They like to pretend they, so I think deep down, you know, they 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 see the writing on the wall. Yes. So that if if the um you know, Eli benching hadn't occurred. Right. I would, I would agree with you. Yeah. But I think you can't give up that pick. You got to take advantage. of it. I hope yeah. so. I, I just thought that was their opportunity. Stay out of it. Yeah. Stay out of we it. We don't, don't want care. you. You don't care. We don't want you. You're Peter Berg doesn't want you. I want right. you to tell him, Peter Berg. I want you guys to you, keep what you, going. What are you going to do? What are you going to do with your quarterback? What do you do? Uh, You've got a real. You actually have a huge quarterback. So, problem. so Sims's philosophy, and I agree with it, is. They need. I want to move Foles. I believe in Wentz. I think Wentz is everything. I also he won the Super Bowl. So, so you my, can't get, you're you're screwed. You guys are going to implode <laughs> because of your quarterback I know. situation. Right, right. Uh, right what would that, you do? The, the, my, my move. My move would be. I believe having seen these guys for a long time, they're the too few non-ego quarterbacks that truly are like the team, spiritual, religious, all that stuff. Right. I think they can coexist, and then I move Foles when what team like you gets really desperate. There's there's no such thing as a – first of all, the Giants will never be truly desperate. Okay, we're New York football Giants. <laughs> Second of all, there's no such thing as an egoless quarterback. Okay? That's your right. Like who's uh, – Kirk Cousins drives his grandfather's right. station wagon to work every day. And right. Uh, you know, and, and Phillip Rivers has 
320 children and yes. just praise <laughs> to the Lord all day. I mean, Mariota's there's, it's a all, quarterbacks it's talk it's to all, God, too. I mean, they're, you know, they have that kind of direct Russell, pipeline. Yeah, it's Russell Wilson and Tim Tebow talk. There, there's no pipeline. way you keep can keep both of those. I know. we got to move on. I'm moving full, so I'm keeping Wayne Swens as the future. You know about quarterbacks, though. Right now, Verizon Go 90. You have QB1, Beyond the Lights. Of course, you did Friday Night Lights. I feel like at this point, if anyone does a high school football or college and they don't talk to you, <laughs> they're missing out. Uh, it's funny. It's QB1. And we have this old clip of Chris Sims here back when he was recruit number one. Well, in I was the in country. QB one the first year or two, though, wasn't I? I was in the I was in the Sims was the number one recruit in high school. Yeah. And this is when he announced he was going to Tennessee, which he then later backtracked and went to Texas. What an asshole. I what am. a story that could have been. <laughs> the number one recruit in the country. Committing and then decommitting. Why did Why did you decommit? What happened? Their offense. Mac, Mac Brown get you? No, well, I liked Mac a lot, but and I liked Texas a lot. I actually liked Texas more. The situation at Texas was a little more dicey because Major Applewhite was there, and he was only a redshirt sophomore. Tennessee, I was going to have to redshirt. T. Martin was still going to be there one more year, but David Cutcliffe, if you know him, he's the coach of Duke now. He was the OC for Peyton Manning in mm -hmm. Tennessee. He went to Ole Miss. For Eli. Well, because Eli was coming the same year I was as well. So he was going to go there, and he knew he was going to get Eli at Ole Miss. And that's really what made me reconsider and change my mind. Well, and did your yeah. father counsel you closely on that? No, not, not, not at all, really. Really? Yeah, my dad stayed out of it. In fact, he made a comment uh, at dinner on Friday night because he not only was like, damn, you should have stayed at uh, <laughs> Tennessee to play football there. He also said, damn, you should have just played baseball and said forget <laughs> about football. So, uh, But he was good for the most part. I mean, I could always ask him a little. Little, little things certainly but he let me make my own decision it's it's th these kinds of decisions are, i mean it's a high class problem obviously yeah, right but, and, and we deal with it um in qb1 in the sense that uh, justin fields who's you know, arguably the best high school quarterback sure. right, just committed to atlanta and so he's going to be playing behind you know i i can't he's going to be in georgia thinking, yeah, behind i'm sorry but behind georgia he's playing yeah. on georgia behind uh, jake, jake from right so it's it's crazy. It's an odd decision, yeah. you know, and I'm not quite sure, you know, why, why he would do that. But it's fa it's been fascinating for us. And if you if you watch QB one, his story is yeah, you know, pr pretty pretty amazing. I imagine you're learning a lot of this stuff. What has taken you back yeah. in terms of what you've witnessed with all these kids? I mean, it's you know, I I'm just truly I'm part of this team. There's a bunch of guys working sure. a lot harder for me, and I get to you know have my name on QB one and. Um, get to come and get some press and probably receive a little more credit than I, I deserve. <laughs> Other than, you know, these guys came to me after seeing Friday Night Lights. And, you know, after we did the movie, th we did the TV show because there was so, so much passion left sure. for this this unique world of high, of high school football, which yeah. obviously you know. Um, and as cliched as, as it gets, it, it truly is a religious, social experience that transcends football. And... I'm always surprised at how it gets me every time. Mm. And just literally when I think I've had enough, I've, I'm saturated, I can no longer, these stories come out. And if, if you watch uh, QB1, I mean, it, it's just a really fucking good show. Yeah. Right. And and I, I'm a, a much a sp spectator. I wasn't there during the filming. I get to come in and meet the players mm. and meet their families now. But it's, I mean, I, I, I defy you to watch it and not get utterly caught up in yeah. how emotional these stories are. And, you know, when you meet these kids and their families and you realize the pressure that yeah. they're under and you realize, um, you know, for, for me, uh, in, in a world that we live in today where there's so much shit and so much criticism and everybody's ready to kill everyone, at the end of the day, you look at these athletes and these are just good guys. It's pure. Yeah, and, and they're, it's pure. There's a lot of discipline. There's a lot of character. The relationship with the coaches. Yeah, right. it's, it's very hard not to, to feel like there's very good things happening. Kids here, are great because right? they don't know what they don't know. And so they're experiencing everything for the first time and it's raw. And then also the pressure. I mean, I've seen kids commit, and then their parents stand up, and they're disappointed with it. We don't know if there's money involved with all Life these things. Life-altering decisions. It, it really can, because yeah. like you said, you go and you sit behind the wrong player. That's right. What do we ever hear from you? That's yeah, right. I know. Well, and that the the coaches are under this extraordinary pressure. But even you're you're a head coach, uh, in, you know, high school in in Atlanta or yeah. in, uh, somewhere in Georgia today, and you're. Your 17-year-old quarterback throws three picks. You're now a defensive coordinator headed to, like, <laughs> Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> right. And the family's moving. And 
and it's uh, you know, it's something that that got me um, when I, I remember when I was living with the high school in Texas, um, Austin Westlake, where your guy went, right, and Drew Brees went also. Yeah, Nick Foles. Yeah, um, Nick Foles went, and Drew Brees went. And um, I was at a playoff game, and there was a 16-year-old quarterback, Mark Oliver, and they were losing I think, you know, two touchdowns at halftime. And I remember there were 10 grown men around this kid in the locker oh room just God. screaming questions at him. Can you see this? Can you do this? Can you make – and this kid was re re had, dealing with so much pressure at that age. And, the, and these men wanted to win, but their families and their, right. their jobs were on the line. Right. And I remember thinking – um, there really is nothing quite like high school football QB one position Man. in terms of just looking at real bona fide pressure. Right. And, and our show has it in in spades this this That's season. That's awesome. It's very it's very good show. Cool. When, when does it start? When does QB season two start? Oh, that's a tough question. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would think in the next week. In the next week. It's on Go90. Right. Uh, or Complex, which um, are two networks that I never knew existed. Right. Um, you walked in here, you had a lot of questions. I feel like a lot of this internet video landscape is, is well, kind of it's, interesting. It's, I mean, I don't, you know, you walk, you walk into a, a facility like a Bleacher Report, yeah. and it's, you know, you think, uh, and I think I'm going to see like four drunk guys playing beer pong, <laughs> um, and, you know, and somebody's sister holding a camera, uh -huh. yeah. and this is, you know, for anyone that's... This isn't Barstool, this is Bleacher Report, Peter Burke. <laughs> Did I say Barstool? I <laughs> said Barstool. No, 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 but we're saying drunk oh, playing okay. ping pong. But, 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 but Barstool <laughs> is, is equally now, yes. you know, as, yeah. it, as is Vice. Yeah, of course. Um, yep. So, so you know, we're, I, I was out... Um, with a buddy of mine, Justin Thoreau. I don't sure. know if yeah. from, uh, I worked with him in The Leftovers, and we were just having a, a conversation last night um, over a lot of, lot of sake. I mean, like a sake lot. Sake me, baby. Yeah, so I'm not. I'm Hot at, or cold? I'm at about, it was cold. I'm right, at about nice. 30%, 30 percent right now. All right, good, frank. good. But we were talking pull about off 30 well. uh, how the landscape is changing so incredibly radically. Mm. You know, and I have a, an 18-year-old son who watches things in ways that, that I could never imagine. And so when, you know, I got a call from Verizon and a, a, a platform called Go90 right. um, saying that they wanted to, you know, do this QB1. And well, I'm like, well, I, where are we going to get like $400 and yeah. like a bus <laughs> ticket to make it? But the fact is it's, it is a new, a new world. And, it is. And people are watching um, things in all kinds of bizarre ways. It's changing very, very quickly. It's crazy. But that's where we are. We yeah. are in uh, uh, Go90. And have you, do you know where Go90 is? Of course. Is? I do. I know of Go90. You Go guys 90. all know where Go90 is? Yeah. You're they all don't full ever, they you keep, don't know No, they do. This is Millennial Central, Peter. you okay. got to remember. Right. Yeah, okay. They keep me cool. Well, like, I'm you. like I'm like you. You're I'm amazing. coolest. I just got an email like four so years ago. You, okay. you talk, though, is we're going to this new world, but you have a passion, and I think you share it with <clears> Mark Wahlberg, and that is for something very traditional in boxing. Yes. And you guys are getting involved right now. Churchill Management, you yes. actually have boxers. This is the great white hype right here. It's another movie, okay, that I grew up watching this guy, The Great White Hype. So, I, I've, o I've always loved, loved yeah. boxing, and uh, Freddie Roach, who I think is the best oh. trainer in the world, is, yeah. is a um, you know a dear friend of mine. Uh, and about, oh, God, five or six years ago, I was thinking, like, I need I need a hobby, you know. I'm pretty busy, but I need a hobby. And yeah. a lot of my friends are, you know, opening up bars or restaurants or pizzerias or starting, you know, investing in sneaker. Con and I was like, well, do I really want to put money in a bar. Mm. If I put money in a bar, go I'm going to get drunk every night. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's just, I'm just going to be drunk all the time. <laughs> It'll be fun for the first week. And the second week, maybe, your question. Maybe the first yeah. month. Maybe. Okay, okay. I feel I'll like I could probably get a good month out of it. But then I'm going to just be drunk. And if I put a restaurant, I'm just going to get really fat. Right. And, and I'm thinking, well, if I if I start a boxing gym, I'm going to actually have to do something, you know, relatively right. fitness oriented. Yeah, that's and right. that, that can't be bad, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Ah, fitness is good. Yes. I think you're we, looking good, too. You got the veins popping I was out. Say the I mean, you're looking It's right. boxing. Okay. Nice. I got boxing. Nice. But so I um, started this gym with Freddie. And then, uh, you know, they say the, the rule number one in boxing is never fall in love with your fighters. That's right. one, And rule number two is you will yeah. always fall in love with your fighters. Yeah. And I started meeting all these young boxers. And whether they're you know, Europeans, uh, guys from South America, a lot, a lot of Mexicans, Americans, all these different kids coming. And the sport is so 
fucking broken. Right. I mean, and people talk a little bit about this, but it's it's mind blowing. I mean, you've, people have heard the yeah. judges screwing up contests, the UFC's cut into it a little Mul- bit, multiple title too, belts for the same the, weight too class, many belts, too many promoters. Yes, the UFC is you know their combat sports is cannibalizing itself right. a bit. But the real the real like what what got me is kind of like uh, you know upset me and and inspired me was these. Kids are such incredible athletes. I mean, I really put say boxers are the best athletes, certainly in the best condition. The workouts are the yes. craziest ones. And, and fighting, try yeah. just fighting is is a very complicated. Yeah, just shadow box for yeah. two minutes and see or, how you hold or up. Or just get in the ring and fight for your life for like yeah. right. you know twelve three minute rounds. It's, yeah. it's brutal. And these kids work so hard and they train so hard. And you look at them and you know, I'm like, well, what's your what's your dream? You know, and you ask a young high school hmm. football player, he wants the Vince Lombardi, right? You talk right. baseball player, MLB. You, you understand, every, athletes have a dream. Well, you talk to a young fighter, and they're like, um, I want to be the um, super light middleweight WBC yeah, right. um, undisputed champion. Right. I mean, it's so sort of, they, they, there's not, not even a clear path to mm. victory. The finances are, you know, at the top. The, the you Great. Know, what, what Mayweather does, right. you if you go to a Mayweather fight, or, or now, I, you know, I guess it, like the but, Canelo Triple G fight. Right. Maybe, you know, these guys are making obscene amounts of money. Right. But the number two guy on the, on the undercard, so, so you might get Floyd, Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao are splitting, uh, or Conor McGregor, depending on the fight. A few hundred million. A couple, right. hundred, uh, couple yeah. hundred million. The next fighter on that on that card is lucky to 100, make. 100,000? No, less. Really? Maybe, what? Maybe 75. I knew they were fighting for their lives. So, I, I mean, know that. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And then it goes down from there. So you see guys. And, you, and when you, you, know, you go to a fight and you look at the undercard and you'll see two guys fighting 12 rounds or 10 rounds, and I mean beating the shit out of each other. Right. Just really. And they've, they've trained for three months of, you know, of, of Peak camp. physical they're, condition. They're, and they're making $7,200. Man. And that's when rule number two, you always fall in love with your fighters. You know, and I, so I went to uh, Wahlberg's, uh, obviously a good friend of mine, and a group of guys mainly from New York, and we kind of put together um, a fund and we started a management company. We're, we're managing two fighters now, and you know the goal is to help these guys develop some kind of a brand, mm. make some money, invest the money well, get some legal advice, get some medical advice, learn um, you know what, what condoms are. Condoms are important. They're pretty good. Right. Yeah. They work. They do. Um, and that's a, a problem that we, <laughs> we deal with. Uh, that's with a, deal, that's a problem with all young athletes. Well, it's, it's, you know, you'd be surprised. That different languages have different words for that. You yeah. have to make sure that we understand it. And so we, <laughs> L condom. we have yeah. some interesting conversations. Oh, I didn't yeah. really like condoms that much. I don't know. I thought no, they were nobody, overrated. No, nobody likes condoms. <laughs> nobody. But, but they're important. Yeah, that's good. I thought <laughs> I was going to go there. Uh, yeah, that was awesome. I like this guy. I, I mean, I, he I, swears. He's just right up yeah, our yeah, alley. Yeah, we didn't even have to tell him that you could no, swear. No, he just said, can I swear. swear? Yes, oh, we yeah, swear. Yes, yes, yes. No. Even though I have had people come up to me today and be like, Maybe not so much. That's cool that you're. I mean, gosh, I know boxing is one of those sports where I always look at it and go, it needs a commissioner. Like it yeah. really needs a unifying commissioner, like a Dana White or yeah. a Roger Goodell, that can keep everybody in line and hold yeah. everybody accountable. It, it does. It needs. It needs to be monopolized. Like back in the day when Crazy Don King was running things, right. now, he was corrupt and stealing everyone's money. Sure, but he was one, basically one guy. It was. You're right. So there, that's why you had. You know, one of the reasons, and everyone will have a different opinion on this, but there was a, there was a monopolization. There's yeah, only yeah. one NFL. Right. There's only one NBA. Right. So you need you need somebody like Dana White would be great. Right. To, yeah. to monopolize it's it. Oh, those leeches, man! Like the Arams of the world, and they're all they're all they're trying all to get a lot of money, place, man. Yeah. Well, and, I get it. And you all you also need to have a fighters union. Of, like I mean, it's the only sport where, you know, these these fighters are completely disenfranchised. So, you know, if you're a fighter and you're a fighter. You're just going to try and survive. You're going to get everything you can. If the top fighters would actually come together and say, "We need some kind of a union. We mm. need to work together," right? But they, there's, they never do. No, they yeah. don't do. I it. know. I know. All right, so we got to wrap. So I want to ask you, what is your forecast for the Giants next season? Will they have a better record than the Eagles? We've Fucking ne- Philadelphia we've, up is the forecast. We've now beaten you seven of the last eight games. I yeah, my, I mean, sins. my my father. Don't shake your head. At me. My when do you remember when um, Deshaun Jackson destroyed the yeah. soul the of the huge comeback? Yeah, yeah. With I mean, that, well, it wasn't really a comeback because we well they were down com- like thirty, but we gave it to you. I mean, if you Stop remember, Mar- um, started Mario <laughs> Manningham running out of beds and literally fumbling <laughs> the ball untouched, 
one nonsense. inch up. I mean, and, and you know, our, our punter punt, delivering it to Deshaun Jackson. So yep. the comeback implies that there was an active, skillful effort. So the made. four touchdowns before. And no, no, <laughs> the, we 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 collapsed and handed you that game. However, that was that was something that has not yet been avenged, and I feel like until. Mm. And then, you know, what, what you did to we've Victor had the, Cruz. We've had the miracle of the Meadowlands. I'm aware of that. We've had uh, Brian Westbrook's I'm aware, I'm aware, I'm aware, I'm aware of everything. I'm all for it. I got Phil Simms drafted. It's, I wouldn't be here without it. You, yeah, also, right. you also really roughed up the career, a career of one of our best receivers, Phil, um, Victor Cruz. Yes, yeah, that did happen. I was That's at right. that game. I don't right. know if that was and, us. He kind of foot hit the turf it was in philadelphia yeah, on your turf it's so. your fault so my my so you're saying our comeuppance is very soon well you're like i say your quarter I, yeah. it's hard for me to say exactly <laughs> what the giants are going to do but you're going to implode because of a, <laughs> a, an unmanageable untenable yes. quarterback situation well, let's hope for that so i'm not worried about you Ugh. i'm more worried about the redskins and their new quarterback uh, that was a surprising move right it and, was and definitely a, a strong move by Alex yep. smith by yep. mr snyder sure. um I don't trust them at all. The Redskins? No. Every year. They find a way they to mess find, it up. They yeah. find a way to mess it up. In the words of Chris Sims, they can ruin a wet dream. Uh, oh, that's kind of true. <laughs> I think um, I, I think the Giants are going are gonna to be fine. We, we need yeah. an offensive line for yeah. sure. We'll be all right. We'll, awesome. And then you'll come back next year, and we'll talk shit to Lefko right, and brother. tell him to shut his ass up. Peter Pleasure Berg. meeting you guys. Thanks for coming, man. man. The myth. Take Appreciate care. You.